Well, good morning. It is always so good to be with you all in the sanctuary. And if we haven't met yet, my name is Megan Hendrickson. I am the Minister to Women and Discipleship Resource Director here at Park Cities. If we haven't met, feel free to come and uh, introduce yourself after the service, just right outside these doors. I'd love to meet you. If you've been joining us for worship this summer, you know that we're in the middle of a summer sermon series entitled Paradox, as we are studying the book of First Timothy and uncovering the truths about God's upside down kingdom and the way that God has made for us to walk in the way of Christ Jesus our Lord which is by definition countercultural set apart and distinct the first week we talked about truth in an age of falsehood as Paul was calling out false teachers in the church at Ephesus as he's writing this letter to Timothy as he's serving among the church at Ephesus. Our second week, we talked about weakness in an age of power and how we are to be a people marked by prayer, a people who use prayer to bring about transformation. Last week, our pastor Jeff preached a powerful sermon in here about unity in an age of division and that in the kingdom of God, we are truly better together as men and as women. If you didn't catch that sermon, I invite you to go online and listen to it this week. I pray you're encouraged. I do want to thank Pastor Jeff for practicing what he preaches and never doing anything less than encouraging me to walk in the way that Christ Jesus makes for me, to follow him by faith and faith alone. So speaking of following, that takes me to where we are today as we talk about following in an age of leading. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, we'll be in the first 13 verses. So if you will stand with me in honor of the Lord our God as I read for us our passage from today. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit who leads us into all truths. So Holy Spirit, will you illuminate your word of truth for us today? I have nothing to offer anyone in this room based on 1 Timothy 3, but I believe your Holy Spirit in me does. So Holy Spirit, will you speak? We're listening. I pray if there's anyone here today who does not yet know you as Christ, our Savior, who's not said yes to your invitation of life and of love, don't let them leave today without saying yes to, do, to you. Would today be the day of their salvation? So Lord God, this time is yours and so are we. Have your way among us for your glory and our good. Amen. You may be seated. So the paradox of today is that in the kingdom of God, the best leaders are the best followers. The best leaders are the best followers. Now, if you're anything like me, as we read this passage about qualifications for deacons and overseers, 
You may be tempted if you're not presently serving as a deacon or an overseer to automatically check out and assume that this message does not apply to you. But I want to encourage you by saying our pastor has not tasked me to break down the particulars of serving as a deacon or an overseer here at Park Cities. We have other meetings for that. Instead, he has entrusted to me the responsibility to break down the importance of following in an age of leading. See, in the kingdom of God, the best leaders are the best followers, but also in the kingdom of God, to serve is to lead and to lead is to follow. So you've heard our ministry team continually sounding the call as of late for us to all come together and serve Christ Jesus and serve his church. Pastor Jeff frequently says, what is your ministry? Doesn't he? He asks us all the time. What is your ministry? He's asking that because the Lord our God who we worship, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we serve because he first served. What is your ministry? That Greek word for ministry means service. The Greek word for minister means servant. And would you believe it's the same word for deacon? And so I believe that this this message today applies to every single one of us. So this list is not about, and this passage is not about being disqualified, but about being qualified in Christ Jesus. It's not a list that's meant to intimidate us, but to invite us to walk closely with Jesus in a rich relationship with him. So there's a few things I want to pull out from this passage as we get started. First off, you'll see that the primary call for overseers and deacons, in verse 2 it says they must be above reproach. In verse 10 it talks about deacons being blameless. Those are two ways to say essentially the same thing, which is this. Those of us who serve as leaders in the church should not give people a reason to find fault with us. Now, Paul is not asking them to be perfect. There's only one who is perfect, and his name is Christ Jesus, and he is the one we worship. But he is the one we worship, therefore we represent him. We are to reflect him. Let us reflect him well. See, those who are serving as leaders in the church are doing two things. They're setting the pace for those who are within the church, but they're also representing the church, the family of God, Christ Jesus himself, to those who are not yet in it. You'll see that in verse 7. It says they must be well thought of by outsiders. Those outsiders are those who are not yet in the family of God. You see, the church at Ephesus at that time didn't have the best reputation. It wasn't exactly clear what the church was about and what was taking place within the family of God. Does that sound familiar? And so Paul is calling for Timothy to instruct the church at Ephesus for those who are serving as leaders to really live as those who are walking with Jesus. It's a high call, and it should be, as we seek to reflect the one we worship. So Paul's speaking to a particular people in a particular time, in a particular place, but I believe that the things that he is speaking about are still relevant to us today, aren't they? As you look through this list, you'll see that there are characteristics, qualifications, and behaviors that are taking place not only when the church gathers, but also when the church scatters, as well as within our home and our family. I believe this emphasis on home and family is because the church is to be the truest family we're ever a part of. The church is the house of God. It is the family of God. We who are in Christ Jesus have been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High King. You'll see in verse 5, it says, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? How will he care for God's church? It's so important to note that we are to see the church as our own family. We are to love her, care for her, serve her, protect her, encourage her as our very own family. Are we living into that reality Paul begins this chapter by saying the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. This is why it's noble. Because those of us who choose to serve the church, to serve Jesus by serving one another in love, we are living out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit in us. That God loves his bride, the church. He loves his sons and daughters so much he sent his own son to live among us, serve us, and sacrifice himself for us. So when we serve and sacrifice for the church, 
God's love and his spirit is being made manifest in us in the church and outside the walls of the church. May we be a people who are known for loving the Lord our God and loving one another. Jesus said it himself in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. As we look at all of this, I think the heart of this whole passage and what Paul is calling for in those who serve as leaders in the church is this. It's holiness. Holiness. We are to be holy as Christ our Savior is holy, as the Lord our God is holy. What does it mean to be holy? Well, to be holy is to be set apart, but not secluded. To be set apart, but not secluded. I believe God desires for us to be a fresh aroma to the world, as we are constantly inviting those around us to taste and see that the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. We are to be holy. And this call to holiness is not new. As Paul's writing to Timothy, who's serving among the church at Ephesus, Paul also wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus called Ephesians. You probably know it. Ephesians chapter 4 begins with Paul saying, as he's writing from prisoner, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, urge you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. He jumps forward in verse 24. In the New Living Translation, he says, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. How can we lead a life worthy of our calling? We put on Christ Jesus. We walk in his spirit living out who he has made us to be, truly righteous and holy. How can we be holy only by the one who is holy? He makes us holy. So this passage is not about what to avoid, but who to enjoy. It's not about what to avoid, but who to enjoy. My message today is not try hard to be like Jesus. If you've heard that message from the church at some point in your life, I just want to say I'm sorry. It's not try hard to be like Jesus. It's hold on as you walk with Jesus. Hold on as you walk with Jesus. Which brings me to our central verse of today. In all 13 verses, as I've spent the last few weeks praying and preparing for this moment with you, there is one verse that continues to jump off the page to me, and it's doing it even now. And I believe that's the spirit of God in me as I'm seeking to practice what I'm preaching about following Jesus and keeping in step with his spirit. I believe that this is where he wants us to spend most of our time as I seek to follow his leading. So verse 9, if you missed it, it says, They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, a surface-level reading of that will tell you that those who serve as leaders in the church must know that they know that they know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Absolutely. Absolutely. But in view of our sermon today about following in an age of leading, I believe that there's so much more that we can take from this verse, too, if you'll join me. So first off, that word hold in other translations means hold fast. Two translations even say, follow. How perfect is that for our word today? They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must follow the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That word clear in Greek also means pure. Some translations say clean. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Finally, there's one word in this verse. And if there's one word I can cling to in the entire chapter, it's this one. Mystery. Mystery. If you're familiar with the writings of Paul, you know that he uses this word on numerous occasions. And almost every occasion, including this one, this is what it means. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ, which at its core is Christ Jesus himself, is it not? 
You cannot have the gospel of Jesus Christ without Jesus Christ. There is no good news apart from Christ Jesus. The gospel that's the power of salvation for all who believe, it's not just about the message. It's about the Messiah. It's not just about salvation. It's about the Savior. This profound mystery that God, the maker of heaven and earth, the only one who is truly holy, loved us so much while we were still sinners, while we were still living as his own enemies. He sent his own son, Jesus, not only to live among us, but to love us, serve us, care for us, suffer and die for us, and to be raised to life for us so that we might live with him forever. Do you know him? This profound mystery that's also a foundational truth that I've built my whole life on. And all of you who are in Christ Jesus have done the same thing. This whole reason we're here today, this mystery of Christ Jesus. Paul says it himself in this same chapter in verse 16. We didn't get there yet. But Paul writes, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He, he Christ Jesus, our Lord, hold fast to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience, with a pure conscience. Christ Jesus said this himself in Luke 9, 23. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What if taking up our cross daily and following Jesus was holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Follow me. In our social media culture today, I believe that we have misunderstood what it means to follow, certainly within the kingdom of God. I can go online right now and follow someone who will choose not to follow me back because they don't know me and I don't even know them. I probably never will and yet I'm following them. How bizarre is that? This is not what following looks like in the kingdom of God. We tend to think of following as following behind, observing from a distance, and trying to do what we witness on our own in this DIY culture. But following in the kingdom is not come and see what I do and go try to do it yourself. It's come with me and let's do this together. There is a witness that is key to our witness. As we follow Jesus, I'm not endorsing this movie. But Morgan Freeman got it right when he played the role of God in Bruce Almighty and he said to Jim Carrey in a diner, come, take a closer walk with me. Come, take a closer walk with me. I really believe this is what Jesus meant when he said, come and follow me to his first disciples and he says it to us each and every day. Come and follow me, come, take a closer walk with me. There's a witness that is key to our witness. I think about it this way. Seven years ago, my parents and I took a trip to New Orleans. I'd never been. My mom and I went to a cooking class, the only one I've ever been a part of. And this chef taught us how to make pralines and bread pudding and gumbo and jambalaya. It was delicious. And as soon as we got home, my mom asked me to make the bread pudding for her Bible study group, and I did. But I have to confess to you that in the last seven years, that's the only thing I ever made from that class. I couldn't tell you today where the recipes are, what ingredients you need to buy, how long it will take to prepare, and how many people it will feed. I have no idea. It didn't stick as I observed from a distance and tried to do it on my own. Compare that too. The day after I finished fourth grade, my family moved from New Mexico to Texas. And we could not imagine moving to Texas and no longer being able to enjoy our favorite breakfast food made by our family friends, the Potters. That is biscuits and chocolate gravy. Don't knock it till you try it. And so Mr. David Potter invited me at just 10 years old to stand side by side with him in his kitchen. As the maker, baker, and creator of this recipe taught me the ins and outs, the tips and tricks of making biscuits and chocolate gravy as we floured up and he taught me how to knead the dough and how to constantly stir the gravy over the pot so it doesn't burn to the bottom. 
And now over 20 years later, I'm still making biscuits and chocolate gravy. I don't need a recipe. I know it like the back of my hand. I can teach anyone and everyone how to make it. I love sharing it with new friends. And my family still enjoys it. Just last weekend, my dad and my big brother requested that I make biscuits and chocolate gravy for our Father's Day brunch. You see, it's stuck. As he invited me to come stand side by side with him in the kitchen. This maker and creator. And we did this together. He taught me how to do it with him, to participate with him. There is a witness that is key to our witness in the kingdom of God. You know, part of the reason the church has such a bad reputation these days is because our leaders have prioritized leading over following. We've prioritized leading over following. But Jesus never asked us to lead. He asked us to follow. Come and follow me. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. He doesn't say lead as I lead. He says follow as I follow. And he doesn't just say follow me, does he? He says follow me as I follow Christ. What would it mean if we interpret Paul to say walk with me as I walk with Jesus? Walk with me as I walk with Jesus, there is a witness that is key to our witness. You see, we care more these days about whether people are following us than whether people are following Jesus. We care more about whether people are following us than whether people are following Jesus. Whether we're holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And as we hear about the moral catastrophes of those who are carrying the name of Jesus, it's precisely because they stopped carrying the name of Jesus. Somewhere along the way, they picked up something else, and in so doing, they stopped clinging to the cross. And maybe it was a good thing at first. Maybe it was to do well in their job or be a good spouse or a good parent. I don't know what it is for them. I don't know what it is for you. But all of us are so quick to pick up anything and everything but Christ Jesus. And in so doing, we stop clinging to the cross. We stop holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. You see, to hold on to the cross, to pick up and carry our cross, to hold on to Jesus, to hold fast to the mystery of the faith... We can't hold on to anything else while doing so. There's no room for that. And so Jesus, this God our Savior, the same God who split the seas in the Old Testament for his own people to walk through in obedience and faith before him is the same God who if you are in Christ Jesus today, his Holy Spirit lives in you and he lives in me. The same God is purifying and clearing the way before us for us to walk with him, for us to follow him. We're so quick to pick up other things, but Jesus said himself, you cannot serve two masters. You'll end up loving one and hating the other. Can't love both God and money. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 9, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And I'm here today to tell you that there's only one who is good and his name is Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. Hate what is evil, Hold fast to what is good. The devil is talked about twice in this passage. We have a very real enemy who's out to not only trip us up, but to steal, kill, and destroy everything about us. But I'm here today to tell you we have a very real Savior who's out to not only make a way for us to know God, but to follow him. Will you let him purify and clear the way before you? Purify your mind, purify your heart, purify your whole life to hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience to pick up your cross and follow him, to walk closely with him as you invite others to walk with you too, to taste and see that the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. If you were here with us last fall, you know that we did a sermon series through the book, in the book of Galatians. It was called Calling Cards of the Faith. As we dug into the fruit of the spirit, what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives, that is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so as I was preparing for this time with you today, the Holy Spirit kept bringing me back to Galatians chapter 5. As Paul writes in verse 16, But I say, 
Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Do you catch that promise? But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He continues in verse 25 to say, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Some translations say, let us follow the Spirit. I appreciate how the ESV points out that to follow is to keep in step with, is it not? If you've heard anything from me today, I pray that it's that, that you hear Christ Jesus saying, come and follow me. Come, take a closer walk with me. And you respond with a desire to walk with him. Now, clearly when you're walking hand in hand with somebody, somebody is taking the lead. Somebody is determining where we're going. That's Jesus. He's not just our savior. He is our Lord. But we're not following behind at a distance, observing and trying to do things on our own. We're walking hand in hand with the maker of heaven and earth who loves us so much. He sent his own son to walk with us. That we get to participate with him in this ministry of reconciliation that he's entrusted to us. How incredible. Are you following him? Are you walking with him? Let him clear the way before you that we may all hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. You'll see on the screen a QR code to take you to this week's sermon response guide. It's available every single week. As God has entrusted his word into us, we have the opportunity to respond. I pray you'll use it in your own time with God, with friends, with family today and this week as you can go deeper into 1 Timothy 3, Galatians 5, Luke 9, all these passages I've touched on today. Go deeper with your maker. Just watch and see as you follow Jesus, as he makes you lead. Because in the kingdom of God, the best leaders are the best followers. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for loving us so much. You sent your son for us, to live with us. I pray that we will hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. If there's anyone in here who doesn't yet know you as Christ, their Savior and their Lord, God, I pray they won't leave today without saying yes to you. May today be the day of their salvation. Amen.